Okay, so there we are. What are you going to need for this course? Well, first thing you're going to need for this course is the textbook. Although it's recommended, it's free. It's an open source textbook that's put together by a group of statisticians and programmers that, in fact, there are other technical books, uh, two or three other technical books that this organization is putting together as well. Open source means that it's available for free for, for anyone that wants to download it. And you can, in fact, as long as you give them credit or credit them with the original work, you can go in and, and change it and, re, and, and, and edit parts of it out and make them available to other people as well. So you know, one of these days we'll actually maybe even you know take that open source textbook and actually pare it down into something that's specific for this course. That's a lot of work, as you can imagine. But it's a free textbook. We've never been happy with the textbooks, and they cost a fortune. So this is a good way to at least be not overjoyed with the textbook, but not have you spend $200 for a book we don't really like. Okay, so if you want, if you prefer a printed version of it, you can download it. There's a couple of locations, including Amazon, where you can download a printed version of this open source textbook for about 11 bucks or something like that. Okay, so uh, you can go on there. I think the, there's a link on there for open intro where you can download this uh, and on Blackboard as well. It's in the syllabus. The link is on the syllabus also. Uh, next thing you need to know, um, because you guys are going to be involved in capstone projects, maybe uh, you're going to be working with sensitive data, sensitive data meaning uh, you know, uh, private medical data or, uh, or personal data in other courses. Um, uh, 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 you're required to take a course in ethics and human research. And there's been plenty of problems with researchers uh, uh, running roughshod over uh, 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 ethically uh, where humans are involved, their information, their data, their health, and so on and so forth. I'm sure you've heard of many of these cases. Um, it's a free online course. It's hosted at a place called cityprogram.org. Um, when you log on to that, many of you have taken this before because you, you're, you're involved in uh, work in hospitals and medical facilities and so on and so forth. Um, uh, it's a series of uh, modules where you'll do a reading. And at the end of the reading of that module, you'll be required to answer five or six questions. Uh, overall, you have to have 80 percent overall score at the end of this. You have to end, end up completing about 10 or 12 of these reading modules. Um, uh, um, you can go back and if you've gotten on, uh, you can go back to any of the sections or modules and you can retake them again without uh, any penalty or anything like that. So it shouldn't be too much trouble. However, I got to caution you for most of us, unless you're really a fast reader and have high comprehension, it's going to take you four or five, six hours to get through this. Okay. And the last thing you want to do is be in a situation where it's the last week of the semester and you got papers due, prod the project is due, so on and so forth. Do this now when things are, you know, things are not so busy in the beginning of the semester, first couple of weeks of the semester. Uh, when you're done with the course, it'll allow you to print out a certificate uh, of, of completion. Uh, uh, there's a location under the grading section or under the, the tab on, on the side of Blackboard where you can click on to upload that, a copy of that uh, uh, certificate whether it's a PDF file or a scan or whatever you want. If you, and if you want, you can even just bring in a hard copy. If you've taken the course before, um, uh, you can bring in a copy of your certificate. You can actually go back in here. Remember your password and log on, by the way, if you can. Uh, you can go back on here and print out a copy if you've taken the course before. One, uh, uh, one rule, though, uh, if it's over 12 months since you've taken the course from today, you have to retake it. But you don't have to retake the whole course. You can take a refresher instead. Okay. Yes. Um, I took the city training um, with NYU. Is it okay? You yeah, that's fine. Yeah, just if it's, if it's been more than a year, do the refresher. Okay. When you go on to it, it's going to ask you to create a logon, password, and so on and so forth. It's going to ask you um, certain kinds of demographic information. You can some of that you can uh, you know like choose not to put in if you don't want to. Um, uh, but when you get through the process, it's going to ask you what your institution is, and you're going to have to look up City University of New York. It's not Hunter, it's City University of New York. Uh, when you've chosen the institution, you'll then have the opportunity to choose what track you want to take. And there's a track for uh, 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 behavioral uh, scientists, for her, uh, medical uh, 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 research, and so on and so forth. There's a track there for graduate students, uh, uh, master's and PhD graduate students. That's the one that we suggest you take. 
If there's another track that is more in line, like for instance, if, you, if there's a track for genetic research and that's really what you're doing, you know, that should be okay too. Just make sure you take one that says specifically ethics and human research, okay? Not animal research, not, you know, uh, sports medicine or anything like that. Ethics and human research. Okay, so basically we need you to do that and I suggest you do it earlier rather than later. Uh, software, what do we need in the way of software? We're gonna be working with software here. That's why we're sitting in front of these machines and not up in a nice, comfortable, cool classroom, okay? So we need you to have access uh, to Excel and Word, okay? Basic tools that most computers are gonna have on them. Um, if you're really tight for money, there are alternatives, open source alternatives. There's something called Neo Office or Open Office uh, uh, that's downloadable and probably will meet most of your needs for this course, but I think most of you guys probably have access to Excel and Word uh, one way or another. You need access to Blackboard, otherwise, you won't get any uh, links, any information that you need, any of the course materials. Anybody here still have a problem getting access to Blackboard? I know this is the first semester for some of you guys. This is kind of an introductory course. No, everybody can get the Blackboard. Good. That's a first. Okay. So they're getting better at ICED, I guess. It's hard to believe, but they, I guess they are. Oops. Okay. Next thing that we need is we're going to be using a piece of what they call vertical software. Vertical software is an application that's designed for a program that's designed for a specific application, in this case, statistics. There's a whole series of them. There's SAS, some of you may have heard of, SPSS. SPSS stands for Statistical Package for the Social Sciences. That was its original name. They changed the name a couple of times. They came back to this name again. It's currently marketed by IBM. They didn't develop it originally, but that's who's marketing it now. Um, there is there are student versions of that software, which is what we're going to be using in this class primarily. The student versions are licensed for a set period of time. The actual piece of software costs a thousand or more dollars for the full package. Uh, the, the, what we'll need to use, though, obviously, if that we save you a few bucks on the uh, on the textbook. We don't want to hit you for a thousand dollars on the software. So there is a version that you can download from a site called OnTheHub.com. Uh, of SPSS for forty dollars, forty to forty-five dollars. I think there's a download fee involved. Uh, you can purchase a six-month license for SPSS. If you're taking Epi next semester and you think you may want to uh, 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 get a twelve-month license, that costs probably around seventy or seventy-five dollars. Okay, so you might want to consider that. But all you need for this course is the cheapest version that's there. No way at all is that we're going to cost over $50. So if you're paying over $50, it's because you want to, not because you have to for this course. Um, uh, make sure they, they have a Mac versions and they have uh, 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 Windows versions. Make sure you download the right version for your computer. You purchase the right version for your computer. Um, if you're really adventurous, there's an open source program called R, which is enormously popular now among uh, professional researchers. Anybody use R in this, uh, work with R at all? Well, maybe at some time, point during the semester we can ex expose you to it so you can see how it works. Uh, so you see what all the what all the hullabaloo is about besides the fact that it's free. Uh, it's one of those things that's been, you know, really caught on in terms of uh, programmers and researchers. It's a, it's a uh, very good tool for them. And they keep adding functionality to it. So it's probably even more dynamic than these very ex expensive commercial uh, products in terms of like being able to do latest kinds of analyses. Okay, that's my contact information. Unfortunately, I don't have an office here. My office is parked at the meter on, for, on Third Avenue over here. Uh, but uh, uh, you have an email for me. And generally, um, but probably not this first week because we're not gonna do that much this first week, really. I, I mean, in, in, you know, in the long run. Uh, but most weeks I'll be doing an extra session during the week, like online for an hour or so where you can where I'll be broadcasting remotely and you can log on and either I'll re, you know, either I'll be, be fielding questions if you have it or, or um, uh, uh, if it, I don't get a lot of questions or something like that, I'll review the material or the quiz with the most recent quiz or any, or any issues that may come up. And if you want like a private session, uh, you know, where I can block, set aside a block of time or 10 or 15 minutes where I can work with you individually, uh, I will work something out. I vary the nights and the times that I do this because what will happen is if I always do it at Thursday 
at uh, seven o'clock, there's going to be somebody who has a class on Thursday at seven o'clock. They can never get to me. So you'll see during the week, as the weeks come up, I'll be telling you this week, I'm going to do Wednesday or this week will be Thursday. This week will be Tuesday at different times. Okay. And I'm probably going to put up like a survey monkey thing or something like that, where I'll ask you where, what the best times for you are. So I can get a general idea when most people are available. Uh, Finger is going to take, yes. It's everywhere. Every one of these computers has that program. However, I, I recommend that you, you buy, you know, even though you don't, you can use these computers or you may have it at work. It's like a bicycle. The way that, you know, you, 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 if you don't have access to a bicycle or easy access to a bicycle, it's hard to learn how to ride a bicycle. So this is really something you need to practice. And particularly, you know, for the exams, you don't want to be flubbing around with the menus and stuff like that, trying to figure out where stuff is. You want to be, you know, have a casual acquaintance with this stuff so that you know, you know, how to work with the thing very, relatively easily and and, and uh, quickly. So I recommend you, you, you bite the bullet, buy, spend the $40 and download, download it and have it on your own computers. If you're really stuck, it's on every machine here, 68th Street, uh, in a library. So basically anywhere, any of these machines you'll be able to work with it on here if you don't have it available to you uh, now or if you just don't want to buy it. Okay, So it is available on all of these machines, as is Excel and Word. Okay. Professor, yes. I just want to let you know, by doing that the way you have done it, don't wait for the last minute you want it to have it verify and scan my ID card and that goes to copy. It can verify my student status, which would be fair to the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, they, they've gotten very, they, they, they don't like getting beat. For instance, I can't download a student copy because they know I'm, a, I'm on faculty. When I put my email address, somehow they know that I'm on faculty and I can't download it. And I have to, I have a war every semester with ISIT to try and get a copy put on, onto my machine because technically they're not really supposed to do that. So in fact, if I do a demo now in SPSS, I'm going to be switching to the PC because I don't have a currently licensed copy on my machine. Now, um, uh, of course, best way to get me or ask me questions in, in, the, uh, in between these times when you have access to me is by email. And um, uh, I can uh, for sure I'll get back to you within 24 to 48 hours. Very frequently, it'll be sooner. But I, I, you know, I promise 24 to 48 hours. Okay, lectures. You, you see, yeah, I basically, you, know, you figured it out, right? Except we're in lab, we're in C05. Um, um, and it's going to vary. Sometimes you'll be here, you'll have a lecture for an hour, sometimes an hour and a half. But within 10 minutes after the lecture's over, we're going to go through our lab. Um, In-class attendance is also required on four dates during the syllabus. Uh, uh, this session now, just so we have to get acquainted and we know where, you know, what, what we all need and so on and so forth. And exam one, which is in about four or five weeks, exam two, which is another four or five weeks. And then the last session of the semester, instead of a final, is going to be uh, that project presentation, project or project presentation. I'm not sure it's going to be a presentation involved this semester or not. Okay, if you choose to follow the class remotely, as I says, I'm simulcasting it now. You can see me moving stuff around. You can see my uh, me going through the PowerPoint here. Just as it, it, this is exactly what you would be seeing at home too. You'd be hearing my voice over the speaker on your computer or over you know headphones if you the rest of your family doesn't isn't interested in hearing me drone on. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and after this session, I'll be taking that recording. I have to do a conversion and uploading it to YouTube. So you'll be you have access to it on YouTube. It usually takes me a day or two to do that because the conversion process can take, you know, an hour or two, and then I have to upload it. And if my connection's bad, that could take a little while as well. The advantage of Google Hangouts is that uh, it instantly records it. However, the disadvantage of Google Hangouts, in other words, is one of the reasons I'm using this instead, there's a long lag, as much as a minute or two. So if I'm saying something here, when you, if you're sitting in the class, you won't see the screen change for two minutes. Right. So I can't have that. It's got to be fast. That's another reason why I use this instead of Google Hangouts. When you're watching a PowerPoint presentation remotely, you don't have to worry about that. OK, OK. Now, like you don't have to attend these sessions. Right. You could you can say get it online in real time as we're broadcasting or you can time shift it. If you're if you have really pressed for time on Monday night, you can watch the lecture and the uh, 
lab on Tuesday night or some other time. And you can always go back and take a look at it again. Nice thing about this, too, when you get the video is you, get, you can scrub back and forth. If you want to go to a certain section of it, you don't have to go through the whole hour and a half. I've been told by people that presumably know that the optimal length of time for an online video training session is somewhere around 10 or 15 minutes. We don't have the luxury of doing 10 or 15 minute videos here. So, I mean, this isn't going to be an hour and a half, basically. So instead, you don't have to watch the whole thing. If you're getting bored and falling asleep, stop. Go back to it later on. Okay, now the other advantage of coming in here, uh, 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 in addition to all the rest of this, the most important one is technology can fail every once in a while. If I can't convert the recording, I can't upload the video. So it's lost to the ether. Uh, ether. Okay, now, um, when I was taking statistics in the year of the flood, um, we did most of our calculations using pencils and papers and, and uh, uh, mechanical, uh, the mechanical devices. For instance, that's the kind of machine that I did the calculations that you were going to do now on. That was, I think I took biostatistics as a freshman in college, uh, not biostatistics, statistics, as a freshman in college, and that was like 1967, 66 or 67. And that's literally what we used. There were no electronic calculators. There was, there was only one electronic calculator that was available at that time made by a company called Wang. It used Nixie tubes. You guys know what Nixie tubes are? They're like those big, like, you know, glowing uh, uh, vacuum tubes, like radio vacuum tubes with lines in them. That, that like light up, that glow, those are Nixie, they use Nixie tubes. And it could like add and uh, add and subtract, multiply and divide, and it costs like $70,000. Mm -hmm. And it's the closest we as students could get to it is we could peer at it through the, you know, they had those windows with the wire in them. And so, you know, we could, we could kind of peer at it. We weren't allowed to touch it, unfortunately. So this is what we used at that time. Things changed quickly though. I mean, um, uh, yeah, that's the other thing we use, slide rules. I have one of those with me if you're interested in, in playing with it. And then eventually electronic calculators started to turn up and really started to change things quite a bit. Nowadays, we use computers for these kind of applications. The, one of the programs, there's a couple of programs that are particularly useful for doing calculations. Uh, one of them is Excel. Excel is a type of software called a spreadsheet. This kind of software didn't exist on microcomputers uh, uh, until about 19, I think 1979 or 1980. First, the first working spreadsheet program, Excel type program, uh, uh, ran on an Apple II computer. It was called VisiCalc. It was an immense development. It was really pushed the, the uh, marketing of Apple. It was really one of the things that sold Apple computers to businesses at that time. Uh, this was like two, three years before IBM launch the PC. And the difference here is that what happened here is, is that this program that a couple of people, Dan Bricklin and another guy developed, um, uh, uh, took a paper ledger. You ever seen accounting people? They, they have like these ledgers, these giant ledgers, and they have like a column of numbers, uh, 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 credits and debits, and they'd put all the credits down, all the uh, debits down at the bottom. They'd add them up and they'd go to the next page and write that at the top. And they'd have all this, they do this double entry bookkeeping. One of the things that happens is, is if they make a mistake, right, they can't go back and change all the previous calculations. So what they do is they do another credit or debit to balance the mistake and make a note of why it was done and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, when this spreadsheet software became available, it was a way to put onto a computer screen where you have little boxes, which represent the columns and the rows on this paper ledger where you could put in a number and you could go back and edit that number. And you could do calculations on that number that could be updated without um, uh, uh, quickly and easily. So you didn't have to go back and redo everything that you would do. And I got a couple of little videos I want, uh, that we have time for. I'm gonna show you at the end. Uh, this, is the, this is Dan Bricklin and his partner. Uh, I don't need that right now. We're not gonna show that right now. Okay, so that's what, that's what spreadsheets do for us. Okay, one of the natures of spreadsheets is, and that makes them very useful, is you can embed, for, embed formulas into the cells in spreadsheets. Many of you have used Excel pretty extensively, so you're pretty much aware of this. Uh, we're going to be looking at using it in uh, statistics specifically. 
Um, uh, now, beyond that, there's other programs. Remember, we're going to be we're going to be working with a lot of data. We have to record, we have to input it, we have to record it, we have to manipulate it, we have to organize it. So there's programs called database programs. Those are programs that are specifically designed for for uh, 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 handling and storing and manipulating enormous amounts of data. Okay, your phone, for instance, people that run your phone that make up phone book. Uh, whatever is a phone, whatever uh, works for a phone book these days, uh, uh, working with database programs. Your bank is working with database programs. Um, uh, uh, they're organized very similarly, except that they have special me- they have special mechanisms built into them for handling and uh, organizing and doing calculations on data. A bit different than than uh, spreadsheet programs are, but very useful. And a lot of this stuff can be moved between spreadsheets in database programs and statistical programs like SPSS. Okay, so, so here's our statistical application. That's the, latest, that's the top of the rung for us in terms of the capability of doing statistical analyses, SPSS, SAS, and R. Now, SPSS, we're going to be demonstrating that, and uh, I'm not going to go over this. It looks, when you open it up and start, it looks very much like a spreadsheet, just like Excel. It's nothing like Excel. Works completely different, so don't be fooled by that. We're going to take a look at that. Data types, we talked about it. This is important because as we talk about data types with SPSS and Excel and so on and so forth, the type of data that it is is critical to how we handle it. So we know we talked about nominal data. We talked about numerical data, which is continuous or discrete data. Discrete data, we remember it's referred to as a count. A lot of times you can just look at it as integer data. Right. If you have, you have um, uh, two children in the family or something like that, it's an integer. Uh, and you have ordinal data. Ordinal data um, uh, uh, has nominal data is a name uh, or, or a value that, that's represented by a category or a name for a category. Uh, for instance, uh, hair color right, is a nominal is nominal data or categorical data. Now, these have these have a few different. Nominal data very frequently is called categorical data. Um, uh, 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 continuous data is sometimes called scalar data or numerical data. And then there's ordinal data. Ordinal data is things that are really kind of look like nominal data, but they actually have some value, some order to them. For instance, um, uh, 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 the perform- your performance in this course could be fair, good, excellent, or uh, 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 outstanding, right? Now, even those are words, their their names are words, they have order. One is greater than the other. You guys, uh, you know, in medicine, you work with a pain scale. You ask a patient, uh, how much pain, on a scale of one to 10, how much pain are you in? Okay, well, they might say eight, you know, or they might say seven, or so on and so forth. What's the difference between that and, say, a discrete data? Well, the difference is, is that one person's eight may not be the same as another person's eight. And in fact, the difference, and when that person says, oh, it went from an eight to a six, right? Well, that may not be the same as when he says it went from a five to a three. It has order. It's ordinal. It has order. But there's no, it, it, it's not on a scale that we can rely on to be uniform. Okay, so we have we have, uh, and in SPSS, when we work with SPSS, it narrows these classes down to three groups because basically you're going to do the same kinds of analysis, different kinds of analysis on three groups, nominal, scalar, and ordinal. Okay, So it's important that we identify what kind of data that we're working on. Another little trick that's going to come up occasionally is uh, if I were to type in every time I uh, was entering, and when I was entering data, if I typed in female for gender, uh, patient number one, female. Patient number two, male. Patient number three, female. Computers take things very literally. So if I capitalize female in one instance, it may not recognize it if I don't capitalize it as being the same thing. Okay. If I misspell it, it won't recognize it. So very frequently we represent nominal data using letters or numbers. For instance, I might call female one and male two. So from then on, it'll speed up the entry as well. One, two, one, 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 two, two, two. Really represent male and female. So even though it's a number, it's really nominal. And in SPSS, we tell SPSS what that one or two represents when we set SPSS up. We're going to get we're going to chance to 
play with that in a, in a few moments. Okay, and next thing you should keep an eye open for is, is that as we start to talk about this stuff, sometimes we'll be talking about populations, sometimes we'll be talking about statistics. Keep in mind that when we're talking about a population, we frequently use Greek letters to represent the parameters for that population. For instance, mu, the Greek letter mu, for, uh, for uh, 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 the mean of a population. Sigma, chi, so on and so forth. We use those numbers to represent a population. When we're talking about a sample, we use um, uh, normal Arabic letters, X, SD, VAR for variation, and so variance, and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, one of the first things we're going to want to do is organize data. Okay, and a lot of ways to organize data. We we'll organize it into tables, right? Like this. We can uh, we can also organize it into charts. Like for instance, right here we have a number of students that have different hair color. Red. You can tell this is English, right? C O L O U R. Um, um, uh, two two of the students have red hair. Uh, Twelve of the students have uh, uh, brown hair. Uh, uh, so many of blonde, so on and so forth. Now, this is called a bar chart. When we have, when we want to organize uh, 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 nominal data, we frequently put it into tables, or we display it as a bar graph. Not in, in numerical data. We also display graphically. In this case, uh, we're talking about the heights of thirty people. Notice something. What, what, what's the biggest difference you notice between these two tables? Kind of like a really elementary difference. There's no spaces, you know, in the in that table, right? That's because that that represents that bar. Each one of those bars represents a range, a range between 135 and 100, 135 and 100, and, uh, excuse me, 139, 139.5 and 149.5, and 159.5. So any new individual is gonna Going to go into one of those, going to go in to make one of those bars a little bit higher. So there's no gaps where, in fact, there's no real relationship between red hair and black hair. They're just separate counts. Right? So that is called a histogram. Histogram is what we work with with, uh, 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 with uh, numerical data. A bar chart is what we use to describe uh, categorical data. Okay. Okay. Is that a bar chart or a histogram? Male and female. Bar chart, right? Okay, what's that? Bar chart or histogram? Instagram. Right. What's that? that? That's a whiskey bar chart. <laughs> what's that? Candy bar. Candy bar chart. I got, I got one more. Sushi bar, Sushi bar chart. There you go. Okay, good. All right. There's other ways of describing data uh, 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 graphically. This is a, uh, a function that we're going to use later on, which is called a box plot. We'll get into how that works. Scatter plots where we, we uh, pair up data and we, we look for a relationship between the two, a correlation, and so on and so forth. I don't want to show this video now. And we're going to get some hands on practice now. If you want, you can download. Actually, tell you the truth, don't even bother to download because this first example is really kind of intended for people that like really haven't used Excel very much before. Okay, so let me get this out of the way. Okay, so I'm going to blow this up so I can actually, we can all actually see it. Can you see it up there? Okay. So this is actually, I, I forget what I call this, cell end function. You'll see it under one of the uh, entries on Blackboard when you, if you want to go back there at some point. Okay, so now one of the, the nature of Excel is, is that each one of these uh, boxes, each one of these cells, as they're called in Excel, is described by its position. It can have a, it, it, it has, it can have a row and it can have a column. For instance, uh, this word label is in the uh, cell B2, and so on and so forth. Uh, this right now, what I have highlighted is uh, cell C7, and so on. Each one of these cells can hold one of three kinds of information. It can hold a label. Label can be something like January, a word. It's a text word. January. It could be February. It could be hair color, uh, color, and so on and so forth. It can hold a number. Right, so number might be 789.7.9, let's say, right? And finally, it can hold a function, okay? And a function means that it can hold a calculation based on the other cells, okay? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna for instance, here, I'm gonna say the function here, I'm gonna put an equal sign in there. As soon as I put an equal sign into a cell, Excel knows that I wanna create a function in that cell. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that that this function is going to be uh, uh, the value that's in cell C3, C3 plus 100, plus the number 100. And I'm going to hit enter, and it's going to do that calculation. And that's going to be 889, right? 0.9, just what we would expect if we added 100 to that number. The power of this is, is that if I go through very complex calculations, I'm trying to calculate the trajectory of a uh, satellite uh, to put it into orbit around Mars. And I've done thousands of calculations to get to a velocity that I need. If I realize I've had a, I made a mistake midway through, now I have to go back and do all those calculations all over again. Well, in, with using Excel or spreadsheets in general, not just Excel, there are, there, believe it or not, are other spreadsheets. If I've made a mistake, I can go back anywhere in that series of calculations and, sh and make that correction, and it will update all of the cells or all of the calculations that were based on it. This was an elementary kind of application. You can imagine how much trouble that could save you if you're doing engineering calculations, if you're doing uh, uh, financial calculations, and so on and so forth. Okay, so for instance, right here I have a, a, a series of uh, uh, quantity. Quant each one of these cells represents a quantity of, say, an item that we're that's in our shop, shopping cart on a, on uh, Amazon. This is the cost per unit. I can say, well, that's equal to ten times eleven dollars and twenty cents, and that's going to be going to cost me one hundred and twelve dollars. Now I could go through here and do the rest of these equals twenty times twenty dollars. Uh, notice I'm using an asterisk to represent multiplication. That's going to be $400. Now, if I have a really long list of these things, what I can do now instead, now if I click into this 40, you'll notice that it doesn't say 40 in this little window up here that describes what's in that cell. It says F4 times C4. It shows the calculation. I'm sorry? I did a plus. I didn't hit an asterisk. Okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, that's better. Okay, so if I go into this 400, I can see that it's F4 times C4. Okay, now, one of the powers that we have here is since these columns are aligned together, I can actually just click into this first column. Actually, I'll click into 112. I can click into it, hold down my, uh, uh, my cursor, and drag down, and then tell Excel that I want to, I'm going to come up to Edit, I'm going to say fill. I want to copy that formula down. Now, since there's a, uh, you might say, why doesn't it just copy down 112, which is what, is what it would do if there were a number in there. However, by default, if it sees you doing this and there's a formula in there, it will replicate that formula going all the way down. Now, it did more than that. It did something very important. It worked through that. It took that formula and, it, and increased it re re relatively. So, for instance, 400 was F4 times G4. 140 came from F5 times G5. And uh, uh, F6 came from uh, uh, F6, uh, excuse me, uh, H6 came from F6 times. It, it actually modified the formula to match those pairs of numbers as it went down. So that's going to be very useful to us, okay? And then at the bottom here, I can, I can uh, add up all of these cells. One of the ways I can add up all of these cells is to just say, well, that cell plus that cell plus that cell plus that cell. A better way is to use a function that's embedded in Excel. There's, a, there's many functions, hundreds, maybe thousands of functions that you can add on to Excel uh, uh, where we can tell it to perform the, a specific kind of function. In this case, I'm going to tell it to perform a sum. I'm going to put an equal sign in there. I'm going to ask it to take the sum, and I'm going to put parentheses after this. And notice that I get a little, you can't see it very well on here, but I get a little prompt on there on how, how to proceed. But I can now tell it that I want the sum of, I lost track of what cell that is, from C3, three, I'm going to put a colon in and it'll face, use it as a range to, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, H3, H3. Through um, H7. So it's going to add up all the numbers in those cells in that range. Now, another way that I could have done this, notice that it was very easy for me to make a mistake and type in the wrong cell number. Another way I could have done this is say equals sum 
parentheses. And at that point where I put the parentheses in, it's ready to, you know, get the information about which cells I'm referring to. I can click into the cell that has 112 without lifting up and drag down and it'll automatically fill it in for me. It avoids my making any kind of typo or mistake. I get, I get the same result. Okay, so this is very powerful. We can do a lot of stuff with this. Now, I'm going to open up another, uh, 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 um, I'm not going to bother with this. It's I, uh, uh, Just to give you a what if kind of thing, I was going to hear some of all of the debits, your expenses, uh, some of all of your income, your credits. Okay, and the balance is going to be equal to 1,400 minus 17. If you're anything like me when I was your age, this is what your you know balance looked like at the end of the month. Now, if you're a person that budgets, um, uh, you could go back here and you start saying to yourself, well, can't do anything about rent, can't do anything about transportation. Now I'm going to have to cut back on entertainment. Okay, so let's, let's go down to 300 on that. And uh, uh, let's see, let's save 10 bucks on the phone. Uh, and as I do this, I can see a what if kind of situation. I can see how this alters. And that's one of the powers of Excel. Because the next thing I'm going to open in Excel is we're going to actually do a statistical calculation. You might want to work on this with me. Okay, there's a, um, a file uh, on Blackboard called Descriptive Statistics Exercise 1. Okay, and if you look at this, I start off with, I'm going to blow this up a bit. I don't need to blow it up anymore. Okay. Okay. Start off with a list of numbers. Right. There's a, uh, some data I've collected. Maybe that's no, it's not great to go 100. But maybe that's blood pressures, for instance, that might be in that range, right? So I have a list of numbers, and they're kind of scattered randomly, like a, as if I were taking a random sample and measuring people's blood pressures, blood sugars, whatever. Now, I would love to be able to organize that information. For instance, I'd love to be able to tell, well, what's the range of this? What's the lowest number? What's the highest number? What's the average of this? We, you know, and we don't need to be statisticians to understand the concept of average, although in statistics we refer to it as a mean. Right? What's the mean of this group? How variable is this group? Any, how, do you, how many of you guys uh, know, have heard the words the, uh, standard deviation before? Good. Sum of squares. Okay, a, few, a bit fewer. Okay, we're going to learn something new. Okay, so I want to be able to describe that data, where the middle of it is, the mean, right? The median is happens to be actually the middle value. Actually, we're going to get more into this next week. I'm not going to go into too much of an explanation of this. I just want to show you, give you a demonstration of using Excel to do these kind of calculations. And just to get an idea of where these numbers come from. Okay, So I'm going to take these numbers and I'm going to try and organize them. Okay, so I'm going to move over here to another part of this. And you'll notice that I gave these, the columns titles. Like the numbers themselves are X, right? And the mean, I often call X bar. X with a bar over the top of it. You guys remember if I use Arab, uh, you know, uh, Arabic notation, if I use an A or an X or something like that, is that a population or a sample? That's a sample. So X bar or X with a bar over the top of it, that's the mean of a sample. So I want to calculate what the mean of that sample is, right? I'm kind of interested in that. Okay, and I want to know how many how many uh, items are in that sample. Okay, so I'm going to go down here. See down here, I, I put in a little box here that says mean. I'm going to put an equal sign in there. Well, now, at this point, I know many of these statistical functions that are buried into Excel. But if you don't know them, there's a little f of x up there in that top corner where I can click on that, and it'll bring up a window that will give me a list of all of the different functions that are available to me. Um, they might be, let's see, that's most recently used. You can search for them. Uh, here we go. Um, 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 arithmetic, database, date and time, financial, uh, uh, so on and so forth. We're really interested in the statistical. The, the top is the most re recently used ones. But there's a whole list of statistical functions. You can see there's, there's uh, quite a few of them buried in here. Um, to save time, I'm just going to actually use the ones that I know. Uh, you can go through that list and play around with it and get comfortable with it. 
But I'm going to actually just go ahead. You can actually select them off there. You can also go there for help uh, if you want to know how to use it. So first thing I do is I put an equal sign. And it's waiting for a function. So I'm going to put in average. Okay. In fact, it doesn't have the word mean. It uses the word average. I'm going to hit parentheses. And it's ready for me to tell it what numbers I want to find the average of. And I'm going to tell it I want to find the average of this list of numbers from 99 down to this 97. And the average is 99.94. Right? Pretty powerful. And it's up for me. How many of them are in there anyway? There's a function called count. Parentheses. I can just highlight all of those numbers. And it'll tell me, oops, I did something wrong there. Count. Let me try that again. There we go. There's 18 numbers in that list. Okay. If one of them is one of them's missing, it'll realize that. Now there's 17 numbers in that list. And the average changed as well. Okay. I'm going to undo that because I want that average. Okay. So now I know that the average is roughly 100. 99 point something. Yes. Uh, on Blackboard, that should be. It's under the lab section. And it's probably under one of those four sets of exercises. Under lab materials. Yeah, if you got, I think it's probably use the tab lab materials. It'll it'll uh, bring it to it a little bit quicker. Okay, so let me, let me uh, move on for a second there. Okay, so now I want to find out. Uh, now, I know where the middle is now, right? The middle is about 100, right? So that's called a mean. There's another kind of middle also. Anybody know what that's called? The median. In other words, this is the arithmetic average. Where's the middle number? Okay, which one of these numbers is in the middle of this distribution? Well, there's a thing that we can use called median. And I'm going to calculate that now, median, parentheses. And the middle number in this group is 101, is the middle value in this. There are nine numbers below that, nine numbers above that, basically. So we'll get into that more next week than we will today. Okay, so I want to see that. It's very interesting now. I got a good idea where the middle of this, of these, of these, uh, of this sample is. Middle of values for this sample. How about how variable is it? Are the numbers all far apart? Are the numbers close together? How, what's a good way for me to measure that? Well, I'm thinking the good way, to, good way for me to measure that is to take each one of the values and see how different it is from the mean. The bigger the difference is, the more variable the values are. So I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to say that, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to say that uh, let's see, x bar is equal to uh, 99.94. Okay, that's what it's equal to. Okay, so now I'm going to say, I'm going to copy that down. Fill down. Up, oh, something went wrong there. Why did that happen? Because remember the way that Excel uses relative addressing? If I tell it to fill a formula down, it's going to move down cell by cell. So it really took... Even though the, media, the mean is in the cell J21, the next number it copied was in J22 and J23 and J24. I need a way to avoid that. There's a, one of the things that you can do, I'm going to click in here into this top one. It says J21. I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to put a dollar sign in front of the J. I'm going to put a dollar sign in front of the 21. Okay, and I'm going to hit Enter. It's still 99.94. It still describes that cell. The difference is, is that when you put the dollar sign in front of the row number and the cell number, it's an absolute address. Excel will not change that address. It will use that address no matter what. So I'm going to click in there and copy this down. Now, by the way, you, you may notice also that if I click in here, if I go over to the corner, there's a little dot in the corner. If I grab that, it knows I want to copy. Oops, that didn't work very well. Oh. Oh, 
there we go. I think I got it. He knows that I want to copy it down. I don't have to go up to film. There's also on your Windows machines, there's also a little, uh, on the ribbon uh, at the top, there's a little fill button where you can use it and you can click on it, or click down on it, and it'll fill down, right, left, and so on and so forth. A lot of ways to skin a cat in this country. Okay, so I've copied that number over. So now I'm going to calculate the difference between each value and the value X bar. By the way, how many of you guys that use Excel a lot just learned something when you learned about absolute addressing? Right? Not too many people know how to use that function. Nobody learned anything. Okay. Okay, so the difference, oops, let me try that again, equals 99 minus 99.9 is 0 0.094. I'm going to, again, I'm going to copy that all the way down. Okay, and so this each one of these cells now has a difference between the value and the mean, right? This one's a, this one's 11, 11 smaller than the mean. This one is six smaller. This one's nine bigger than the mean. Each one of these gives us an idea of the difference between the value and the mean, how variable it is from the mean. Okay, now let's see. One of the ways I might say to myself might be a good way for me to describe how uh, uh, how variable this, the, all these numbers are, is you just simply add up all the differences. But if I do that, if I add up the sum of all of these differences, what's going to happen? Half of these are above the mean, half of these are below the mean, half of these are positive, half of them. What's going to happen when I add them up? It's going to add up to zero. Yeah. Oops. Actually, because it's doing a calculation, it's 10 to the minus 14, but it's functionally zero. Right, it adds up to zero. So now I can't have that. Right, I want to be able to describe the difference here. So now what I might do is I say, there's a couple of ways I can deal with this. One way is to take the absolute value of all of these. Right, just ignore the negative signs. The other way is is that you can always turn a negative number into a positive number by multiplying it by another negative number. Right, or by itself, let's say. So I'm going to take each one of these values for x minus x bar, the differences. Differences between the mean and the value, and I'm going to square them, multiply them by itself. So now that becomes a positive number, and I'm going to copy that down again. Okay, so now I have the squares of the each, the, each one of the differences between the mean and each individual value. So now I'm going to say to myself, I'm going to add up all of those squares of those values. Equals, oops equals sum, and I'm going to add them all up, all the squares of those values, and now it's going to be a positive number, I know, because that's going to be a big positive number, because not only have I taken the negative signs away, but I've squared them, each value, and I'm going to call that something special. I'm going to call that the sum of the squares of the differences, or uh, uh, for short, I'll call it sum of the squares. That's important to us. That's going to come up pretty soon. So now I say to myself, you know, I want to find out what the average difference is in these, in these squares. So I'm going to take it, and I'm going to take it, I'm going to divide it by the number of items by n. In this case, I'm going to divide it by n minus 1. There's, we're going to go into a reason why we do that as we get into the, instead of n later on in the semester. But basically, it's basically a kind of an average of the sum of the squares. I'm going to take the sum. Of all the, oops, I already have the sum. I'm going to take the sum and divide it by 17. Remember, there's 18 items, 18 uh, items in the sample. That number we call the variance. So now the variance is bigger than the real variability of these numbers because we squared it. So now I'm going to take that variance and I'm going to take the square root of it. And there's a function called SQRT. We're finding the square root. I'm going to click in there, get 52.5. And the square root of the variance, which is the sum of the squares divided by uh, the number of, uh, of the sample size, is equal to 7.24. Now, that number is in the range of the variabilities, other numbers. That's called the standard deviation. Seems like kind of an odd way to do this, right? Doesn't seem very direct. But interestingly enough, as we go on in the semester, you're going to find that the, these numbers are going to be enormously useful to us. 
Okay, so what have we done here? We found a way to use Excel to do relatively complicated calculations that involve these numbers. We've used various functions in Excel, like being able to fill down formulas, copy formulas, uh, take square root, uh, sums, averages, and so on and so forth. Now, many of these functions that we just did, we could have used built-in functions for. For instance, I'm going to go back here and I'm going to say equals. We did average before, right? We know how that works. Parentheses. I'm going to take this list of numbers. And it'll give me the average. That's all I needed to do. Well, now how about my, my variance? Okay, let's try equals. VAR. Well, in fact, there is a function called variance, VAR variance. And I'm going to take the variance of these numbers. There's the same number we got before. And let's say I want to find the standard deviation. I'm going to take equals. I'm going to say STDEV, parentheses. There is a function called standard deviation, STDEV. I'm going to do that. And I got the same number I got before. So we have many powerful functions built into, uh, uh, and these, this is just the beginning. There's dozens of others. Many powerful functions built into Excel that will help us organize, understand, do calculations with data. Okay, so how many of you guys are frightened by this? <laughs> okay, well, for starters, you're never going to have to do this again because, be, okay, good, because I could have taught you that to calculate the standard deviation, all you had to do was type equals STDEV and then put the list of numbers. I could have told you that. But then would you know what the standard deviation is or how it's calculated? No. So I did it this way. But relax. You're never, ever going to have to do the calculation I did here again. In fact, for the most part, you're never even going to do it in Excel. You may organize data in Excel. You may use Excel for various functions. They insist that we make sure you know Excel as you move forward because you're going to use it for other stuff going forward. So it's not like... You know, I'm, I'm torturing you with uh, with this for no reason. Okay, so so don't get worried. By the end of the semester, you guys are going to be much more comfortable with this stuff. And it's not as kind I ran, I ran through this very quickly. When you get a chance to sit down and go through it a little bit slower, and maybe replay the video and so on and so forth, it's going to be it's going to be uh, I think a bit easier for you. Okay, so 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 we got an idea of how uh, Excel works now uh, in this vein. Okay, so now I'm going to do kind of a similar operation now. Let me see what I, what I have here. Okay, I'm going to do a similar operation using SPSS. And this is going to be our first look at SPSS. I'm going to switch over to the PC. Okay, and in order to switch over to the PC, I'm going to have to... Okay, I'm going to, have to, I'm going to make the PC the host of this webinar. Okay, okay, uh, that's AV. I think it is. Okay. Okay. So now the PC is the quick match. Now, I don't know that you have all of the audio that I'm doing here because I there's no mic unfortunately on this. So I'm just telling to show the screen. It's still recording, presumably. If it doesn't, I'll redo this in, in another fashion. Uh, seems to hear me. Let me make sure I muted everybody first. Except for me. Okay, I'm not muted. Okay. Okay, so now I have to get this on to here. And I think I still have the platform open.
I'm going to download a file, and you might want to do the same thing. It's called, I'm about to tell you what it's called. Hopefully it's not going to mirror my password. Okay, I'm going to go on here. I, you know, I prepped all this. I'm sitting there for a half hour now next door, waiting for you guys to arrive because originally it was C06. As you guys were all filtering in here and getting started, and nobody showed up, so I went up to the second floor to look for you up there. You got the other original classroom, nobody was there. So unfortunately, I pulled that prep work was lost. Uh, so at any rate, let's see, where are my lab materials? Okay. And as I said, if you click on the folder, if you see a folder, you want to click into it. Okay, and you'll see that, you'll see that, um, uh, uh, that there's a written description of what I'm about to do. I'm going to take this and North Carolina birth data, and I'm going to save the link on the desktop here so that we can work with it. There's also kind of a short uh, description of what I'm getting into here in this Word document. I'm not going to use it. You guys are welcome to look at it later on. But as you can see, there's here's the script of statistics exercise one. Uh, there's some other stuff. Uh, here's the, the PowerPoint that I just went through, if you want to go back to this. Here's an interesting article on the Flint, Michigan. If we, if we have a little bit of time, I'll try and get to it. Okay, so now I think I have what I need. Let me get this out of the way. And I'm gonna, there's two ways for me to open SPSS. One is to go down here to the uh, Start button, Start SPSS. The other way is, of course, to double click on an SPSS document. This is a data file for SPSS. When it opens up, we're gonna see what a data file for SPSS looks like. Okay, bingo. That's what it looks like. Okay, so first of all, there we go. Okay, looks like a spreadsheet, doesn't it? Except it doesn't have the functionality of a spreadsheet. This is more of a database type arrangement, a flat file. The columns represent variables. Plurality. Remember what plurality meant? It meant the number of ch children born. Like in other words, if there were twins, there would be a two in there. If there were triplets, there would be a three. Uh, sex. The gender, obviously not the gender of the mother, it's the gender of the child. M age, mother's age, uh, weeks of gestation, marital status. Oh, look at that. Marital status is married, single, right? right? It's the nominal data. But what do you see? They see numbers. That's a problem, right? Okay. Uh, the race of the mother. Notice you see numbers there also. Is the mother Hispanic? You see yeses and noes. The amount of weight gained, uh, uh, whether the mother is a smoker, a drinker. These columns represent variables, gender, age, so on and so forth. What do you think the rows represent? They represent cases. Those are the individual mothers. Let's see how many mothers are in this survey. If you had to work with a pencil here, you have a little bit of a problem, right? The actual data that this is taken from is this is randomly selected from the data set of North Carolina births for the entire year, uh, I think 1994 or 1998, I don't remember what the year was. Uh, but the data set actually uh, contained, I think, 35,000 births. This is has 800 births because we, we trimmed it down and randomly, uh, randomly selected. The reason why we did that is because back five or 10 years ago when we were doing this, the versions of SPSS students were using at that time would not allow for more than 50 variables or 800 cases. That's why we added that. I think the version you're working with doesn't have that limit. But in case it does, we're, we're working with a day set one. So there's actually 15 variables, and there's 800 cases. Each one of these represents a woman that gave birth in North Carolina. Okay, so now, right now, I am in something called the data view. Okay? SPSS has three windows that it works with. One of the windows is called the data view. You actually have two. Within that, you have two ways of looking at the data view. Second window is called the output window. The third window is called the syntax window. 
Okay, right now, the simplest one is the data view. Okay, this, this is data represents, you know, the, the value of the variable for each one. For woman number seven, 71, so she's number 771, uh, she gained 20 pounds during that pregnancy. Okay, so now, if I want to know more about these variables, I can go down here to the bottom, and there's a little tab down here. It says data view and variable view. I'm going to click on the tab that says variable view. So now I have 15 rows. Well, what does that tell you? That tells me each row represents a column on the other view, represents that variable. For instance, for instance, uh, for gender, right? That's the sex of the child. Remember, it's had ones and twos, right? I actually know that. Okay, that's that. That's numeric, meaning it's put. It's a number that I see there. Uh, I have 15 characters I can use for that. I don't need them, but I can. Uh, there's a label. Now, sex is a uh, uh, a variable name. Variable names in SPSS have restrictions. They can only have a certain number of characters. They can't start with a number. Uh, they can't have any spaces. Uh, they can't have certain special characters like asterisks and slashes and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of restrictions on them. So you may not want those when you do your calculations. You may not want something that has that's not very descriptive in the tables or results that you're producing. So what you can do for each one of these is you can give it, in addition to the variable name, you can give it a label. So anywhere where it would make a table and put the word sex in, instead it puts the word sex of the month, uh, sex of the child. Instead of M age, it puts the age of the mother. Just makes it more descriptive, your output more descriptive. You can actually go in there and edit this and change this. Let's look at the sex of the child. That's a nominal variable. It's represented by a number. If you go into values here, I click on that. Oh, well, look, it's telling me that one represents male, two represents female. Okay. And you can create that value table if it's not male. Okay. So that's what this does for us. That's what the variable name does. That's what the variable view does for us. There's a couple of ways to get to that. One is these two tabs down here. The other is up here by view. You can go, you can go let's see, here we go, uh, data, values. I'm just going to go to the data. Now you're in data, you want to go to variables, you can go here. Instead of using those tabs, you can do that. I'm going to go back to data. Since these, since this is coded, in other words, it knows what ones and twos represent for marital status, I can go over here to view again, and I can tell it to turn on the value labels. I'm going to click that, and it substitutes what that one represents for. It's still what you input it is one, but now it, under, it it interprets it for you. Okay, and you can look at this either way. Okay. Whoops, I didn't need to do that. I just want to turn off the value labels. That's called a toggle. Anytime you have something where you click it on or off, uh, it's called a toggle. So this is our data. You know how much weight is gained. We can do all sorts of calculations with this, so on and so forth. I just want to point out for you that there's another thing going on here. There's another table that you're not seeing right now, and that is an output table. Here's output, and there's our output table. Now, it does, there's nothing really in there right now except this text. I'm going to tell you what that text is. I'm going to do something interesting here. I'm going to ask it to calculate the average age and standard deviation for mother's ages for all 800 of these women. Remember, what we had to do for Excel was a little bit cumbersome. We had to identify ranges for 800 women. This would be pretty cumbersome uh, uh, in Excel. I'm going to go to Analyze, Descriptive Statistics, Descriptives. Okay, and I'm going to say, okay, let's see. Mother's age, I'm going to move it in there. And I'm going to say Options. And it's going to calculate the mean and standard deviation already and the variance and the range. I'm going to tell, do all sorts of good stuff. I can say Continue. And I'll say, okay. Now, on the output page, it gives me a table. Eight, there were 800 subjects uh, from 27. Uh, the mother's age went from, uh, went, uh, well, there was a spread of 27 years, right? The minimum age was 15. The maximum age was 42. The mean was 28.92. The standard deviation, you feel a little bit more comfortable now? You're going to have to not have to do a lot of calculations, right? Because we have this amazing tool to do it for us. Okay, now you may have noticed that it added, not only we started with this junk up here, and then we added more text down here. What that is, is that that is part of SPSS's 
what we call syntax. SPSS has built into it a programming language, which it, which it calls a syntax. Okay, and if you look at this top one, what is it doing? It says get the file uh, with the name uh, uh, that with this path and that name, and then uh, create a data set name, data set window equals blah blah blah. Give me the descriptive variables for the mother's age. That's a description of the calculation that we just did. If I copy that and open a syntax window and paste it in there, it will repeat exactly the same calculation. Why are we interested in that? If you have calculations that have to do repeatedly every day, somebody collects a ton of data, they input it, now you have to do a calculation on it. Next day, you got to do the same thing. Next day, you, gotta, you can automate the process by designing a program, an English version of a program in a syntax language in SPSS that describes how to do that process. So you don't physically have to go through repeated calculations each time that you collect data. Okay? Or if there's a problem in the data, you have to redo the calculations or something of that nature. So you can actually go in here and you can open open, right? You can open a data window. You can open an output window. You can open a, a syntax or a script. And syntax and script, we'll get into that. They're basically similar. Okay. So now when you go to close this and you say, okay, I'm all done. Uh, I'm going to save, right? I'm going to save this. Notice that uh, a file name is output and the file type is .spv. I'm going to save it to the desktop. If I can find it this time. There it is. I'm going to say save. Save, 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 save. Okay, it just saved the output window. It didn't save the data, just the output window. If you want to save the data, you have to go to the data window. Window. I'm going to go to window, that's good. And now I can save this. I can say save as. And notice one of the other things I can do here is that if I want, I can save this as an Excel file. Right? So if I want to work with this data in another program, a database program, a student program, I have ways of getting the data out of this program and into this program. I don't want to go into this anymore because I'm, you know, I don't want to get too ambitious this week. The real point here is, is that we're going to look at where a lot of times we're going to be looking at how to do these calculations. It might get a little intimidating. You might see a few formulas here and there. But once you learn how to do the actual calculations themselves, with these tools, you're really not going to be struggling that much. The real challenge is knowing what kinds of tests to apply, how to handle the data, how to describe the data. So it's very important that you understand what nominal data is, what categorical data, what ordinal data is, what, what, uh, what uh, 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 scalar data is. Uh, just so you see, I'm going to save this here, just so you can see on the variable view. SPSS knows the type of data this is. Oops, I just keep doing that. That's kind of hard. Here, look, it knows that plurality, it, it thinks plurality is a nom, is nominal data. It knows that uh, it got sex right, that is the mother's age, it knows it's scale, or it took a guess based on the value, right? Uh, uh, weeks of gestation, it thinks is nominal. We suggest is not nominal. That's a number, right? So it got it wrong. So you have to go in here and tell it, hey, that's wrong. I have to correct this. You know, it's acting very bizarrely. I'm trying to move the window over. You can do it this way. Okay. Uh, you can click on here by nominal, and you can tell it, oh, that's scalar data. Why do I want to do that? Because SPSS may not allow me to do the calculations I want to do if it's incorrectly identified the data. Or the results won't come out correct. Now, what do we do when we're working with nominal data? When we're working with nominal data, we don't do means and averages and so on and so forth, right? I mean, you wouldn't, uh, uh, if you're counting up males and females, right? Gender, for instance, right? You wouldn't want an average of males and females. That doesn't make any sense, right? You want something else. Okay, so what would we want there? Well, we want descriptive statistics. We want frequencies in that case. We want to know how many males and females, how many male uh, 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 infants were born, how many female infants were born, uh, mother's age, marital status. Where is it? 
ethnicity, the mom. These are alphabetical, that's why. Oh, gender. Here we go. Okay, and I'm going to ask it to show me this. I'm not going to do that. Okay, I'm going to ask it to show me this. Okay, and here we go. Frequency is 418 male children, 382. 52% of the births were male. I just found that one. Uh, how about if I want to display that graphically? Descriptive statistics, frequencies. Now I can say, oh, gee, let's do a chart. Uh, well, in this case, we need to do a bar chart, not an histogram, right? So I'll say continue, and I'll say okay. So in, in addition to doing that calculation for me, it also does a bar chart for me. Okay. Next thing I can do is, let's say I want to take this bar chart, and I want to use it somewhere else. I could right-click on it. I can copy it. And now I can paste it into a Word document. Okay. So I can use it in a report or a presentation. How are we doing on time? Anybody know what time it is? Okay, so.